Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. August de Oliveira. I am a general dentist. Uh, I practice in the Los Angeles area, and I am excited today to talk to you about uh, the pros and cons of different implant connections. Um, as a general dentist who is placing implants, uh, prior to placing implants, I wouldn't really choose what implant I used. It was whatever the specialist sent me. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of GPs out there that are either placing their own implants or wanting to listening to this webinar. And so it's a nice uh, way to kind of talk about all the different connections, the pros and the cons of mainly two of them, the internal hex implant and the conical connection, and um, kind of help you out and figure out which one uh, you want to start out with. Um, so go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to talk for a while. Um, I'm going to save all the questions for the end. <laughs> I'm, uh, it's kind of funny, if you've ever seen any of my live surgeries that I've done uh, for Implant Direct, something always goes wrong. So <laughs> earlier today, my computer crashed, and it, it totally killed my um, keynote presentation that I had for this. Luckily, I had made a PDF of it, um, and so I'm lecturing off of the PDF, and it's hard for me to see the little screen and the question bar uh, of the go-to meeting that we're using. So I'm going to wait till the end to answer all the questions, but save them up, type them, and we'll get through as many as we can. So um, a little bit about, about my background. As I said before, I'm a general dentist. Um, I learned how to place implants during my GPR residency ages ago. So uh, about 20 years ago, I did a GPR. And as many of us um, who have gone to dental school a while back, implants were really not part of our general education um, going to dental school. Um, there was an elective on restorative at uh, the University of Washington where I went, uh, but there was definitely nothing surgical. So I was really excited um, that my GPR offered surgical training in implants. However, um, you know, as most new grads getting out of residency or getting out of school, you know, I just wanted to get out and start, uh, you know, working and paying off my student loans and starting a practice. And so I didn't introduce implants really until about 10 years ago in my practice. Um, you know, I relied on different specialists who did excellent, excellent work, um, and I ended up restoring them. And even in restoring them, uh, I went through an evolution of, you know, just using um, stock abutments that this, uh, the specialist torqued down for me with little snappy caps, and eventually getting into doing uh, abutment level and fixture level uh, impressions. Um, as we said before, I wrote a couple of books. So my first book, uh, Implants Made Easy, uh, was just sort of a cookbook approach for GPs to learn how to start placing implants. Um, my second book, which is a lot more popular, is on guided implantology. Um, and as the moderator said before, I do t a lecture for Implant Direct. Um, as a matter of fact, this week, um, flying to Vegas to teach our restorative course. So I teach the restorative course um, at it, our facility in Las Vegas as well as our 3D implantology course there as well. Um, if you ever uh, have a chance um, and check out dentaltown.com, I'm one of the forum moderators for dentaltown.com. Um, dentaltown is great. It's a consumer reports of dentistry. You get all sorts of people um, on there talking about implants. So if you are a newbie, either to restoring or surgically placing implants, I highly recommend you check it out. I moderate the implant form and the mini implant form there. Let's talk a little bit about what uh, this evening is going to be about. We're going to um, talk uh, about mainly three implant connections. So the trilobe implant connection, the internal hex implant connection, and the conical connection as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how these connections uh, affect the surgical placement of the implant, um, as well as, most importantly, 
um, the restorative aspect, and I think that's where you're going to see most of the differences in internal connections. We'll talk a little bit about um, cost difference between different implants and conclude with our Q&A. First things first, let's sort of get the terminology down. And I know we've got different people in our audience. Some people have been placing implants since Branamark. Uh, others are completely new and curious. So I just want to go over some of the terms I'm going to be using today uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. So the implant platform is the top of the implant or the part that uh, you, know, you put an abutment into. Um, in different implant systems, they certainly have all sorts of different colors. Um, one thing that does confuse newbies is that the implant platform, the diameter of the implant platform, may or may not be the same diameter of the implant. So we'll talk later on about something called a platform switch. And a platform switch is very important and very integral to the different types of internal connections that we have. With a platform switch, we've got a fatter implant with a smaller implant platform, and that's done on purpose. And we'll talk about why that's important. Implant bodies uh, really kind of vary out there. Um, there's very parallel walled implants, or some people call them straight implants. We also have very tapered implants as well, and different manufacturers certainly have varying degrees of taper. Um, implant threads are certainly something that's uh, a big area of discussions, not an area of discussion tonight, um, but uh, if you ask my preference on a thread design, I like big aggressive threads. And the implant that you see here is a Legacy 3 implant from Implant Direct that has a very nice thread pattern. Um, implant collars, we will be talking about implant collars today and how they relate um, to the implant connection. Um, most of us are using bone level implants. Um, I prefer a bone level implant that has some sort of implant surface or coating um, all the way to the top of the platform. Some people like tissue level implants. I'm certainly not one of them. Um, but there are indications for tissue level implants, and we will be talking about them. Implant sur services certainly differ between different manufacturers. Um, not really an area of discussion today, um, but I either use one of two types. Um, SVM stands for soluble blast media. Um, it's a process in which an implant is bombarded with hydroxyapatite particles, hence the soluble, uh, and then rinsed off. The other type that I personally use is HJ, and which stands for hydroxyapatite, which I tend to use in D3 and D4 bone. Finally, the apex of the implant, uh, there's two styles out there, um, sharp or blunt. Sharp ap apices are most common in minis where we under-prepare our osteotomy and rely on the implant to travel the rest of the distance. Um, I personally like a blunt apex, and I like a blunt apex because I do a lot of guided implant surgery, and I take a lot of time to plan my implants and my little video games and create surgical guides, and darn it, I want my implant to go where I told it to, not to travel. If you have a sharp apex, there is a chance of an implant traveling. All right, so uh, most importantly, we're going to talk about the different types of implants out there, and let's get a little bit of history here. Um, the external hex implant was really the one that started it all. Um, so back in the day with Brandemark and early fledgling companies, uh, we had external hex implants. And I think that everyone agrees um, that that external hex, that little portion that's sticking out of the top of the implant, just wasn't long enough to resist lateral forces. There are some people that still place external hex implants and different companies such as BioHorizons or Nobel still make uh, external hex implants if that's how you learned and that's what you want. Um, but in general, they've certainly lacked um, in popularity. Um, tissue level implants are something that I started restoring. Um, a lot of periodontists really jumped on the Strauman tissue level implant when it came out because the tissue looks so good around it. We'll talk later on about why tissue and bone look 
great around tissue level implants. And we'll also talk a little bit about their limitation. Um, as a preview, I really don't use them for single tooth restoration. However, they do work great for hybrids. The internal connection or bone level implant, I think that uniformly most people use. In an internal connection implant, we place our implant at or below bone level. Um, there's nothing that comes out of the gingiva or travels through the bone, um, and we uh, attach our abutment or whatever connection we may be using. Now, one-piece implants are interesting. Um, they certainly wax and wane in popularity. Uh, with a one-piece implant, you have an abutment or an attachment that is permanently welded to the implant. And you may ask yourself, why would I want that? Well, the discussion that we're going to have today is really centered about abutments and micro-movements. So if we were to want to emulate anything with our abutments, we would want to emulate the one-piece implant. The one-piece implant, the abutment does not move. Um, although the image that I'm showing you may look kind of like there's a screw hole in there, there is no screw hole because there's no screw. Um, certainly one-piece implants have their um, use in dentistry. Um, I have only used them in lower anteriors and lateral incisors. An area, of course, of another discussion is tie bases. Um, but if you want to use any sort of a ceramic abutment, you have something inside the ceramic called the titanium base. The amount of ceramic surrounding the titanium base has to be at least 600 microns thick. Um, and if you can't get that, you're really going to prep through the ceramic into your tie base. So in areas of limited mesiodistal space, a one-piece implant is kind of cool because there's no screw hole. Um, so you can really prep these things fairly thin and not worry about things breaking. So one thing that's really kind of cool, um, if you want to have a good pulse on what's going on in implantology and trends in implantology is to really look at labs. Um, and labs have um, noticed some interesting trends going on. Um, one thing that's uh, gone up way up is the use of conical connections. And we'll describe exactly what a conical connection is. But the use of conical connections have gone up 268% over the last four years. And that's quite a bit. Um, and what is it about a conical connection uh, that's so cool? Well, we'll figure this out. But before we get into talking about connections, um, I just want to throw down a little bit more terminology and talk about engaging versus non-engaging connectors or abutments or attachments. So we know that if we have a single tooth, we want to stick an abutment in that single tooth. We don't want that abutment to rotate. We want to duplicate what's in the mouth um, and either take an impression or a digital image and uh, have that sort of referenced and not move around. So for most single units, we use uh, engaging connectors. Something goes inside the internal connection and prevents this rotation. When we're using healing abutments or if we're using multi-unit abutments, um, we do want it to spin around. We do uh, want to um, have the freedom of not having to have internal connections draw. And I'll talk a little bit about the all-on-four technique. Um, on certain aspects of the all-on-four technique, you do want engaging, and sometimes you don't want engaging. But let's cut to the chase. So really, if you look at all the different implant connections, the name of the game in well, let's back up a little bit. The name of the game in placing implants as a surgeon is to put your implants into the bone and not have the bone go away. So there's certain things that we do during surgery, uh, not overheat the bone, not over torque it, make sure we have enough bone um, to keep the bone around the implant. Now, 
when it comes to restoring, we can introduce a lot of variables that can cause bone loss later on. Um, we can uh, put into too much occlusion um, and have the patient uh, bite on it uh, with um, non-working interferences and cause it. We can leave cement around it, um, and that too can cause um, uh, some bone loss around the implant. Um, but really, um, this discussion is to talk about um, something called a microgap. Now, um, Dr. Ziprich um, in Germany did a really, really cool study, and I invite anyone to look up Zipperich's studies on different types of implants. And what he did was he looked at various implant connection types under function and figured out how they moved around. Now, if any of you have dealt with um, that call we don't want to get from the patient where they say, hey, doc, I think my implant is loose. The first thing you think about is, OK, I'm freaking out. My implant's going to fall out. But then you see the patient, and it turns out that the implant itself is not loose, however the abutment and or crown is. Um, if you look at the tissue around um, the very loose uh, abutment, it looks really, really bad. And the reason why is that we're pumping all sorts of saliva and bacteria into that implant abutment connection and causing infection. So he looked at that distance, that micro gap between the abutment and the implant itself, and what factors uh, related to that. One other thing, if you read Ziprich studies, or if you go on YouTube, just go ahead and type Ziprich, and um, you'll get to watch his really, really good lecture. And I got to tell you, I'm used to watching very techy lectures and stuff about all sorts of stuff. It is a great lecture in its simplicity because it really gets down to the bottom of it um, about why we have bone loss around implants and a lot of it is related to screw loosing um, and causing of the micro gap. Um, Zimmerich had a really, really good analogy. Remember you were a kid and uh, I grew up in Washington State and basically it rained all the time. And one thing that was always fun to do as a kid was I would go out, I would put on my rain boots and jump around. Um, and um, Dr. Ziprich had a really good analogy. You're jumping around, you're splashing the water, everything is cool, and then you hit a really deep puddle. And what happens? Well, your rain boots fill up with water, and then you're sloshing around, and it's very uncomfortable. Um, one thing that he looked at besides the lateral movement of implants was something that he termed the micro pump. And the micro pump was related to the amount of space and the vacuum that space caused um, on an implant. And so if we have a lot of space inside our implants, if the parts don't fit right, um, and there's just a lot of gap, when you chew back and forth, that lateral movement will open up a micro gap and that micro pump or vacuum will force fluid, saliva, bacteria into your implant and have a nice little home for that implant um, to, or, uh, within that implant for that bacteria. So when designing the ideal implant, we want an implant that does not have much of a micro gap and certainly does not have a lot of space in between the implant components. Um, I apologize, <laughs> my uh, last presentation had a really cool video, so uh, you'll have to use your imagination here, which is really not something you want to do in a lecture. But on the left-hand side, we have a very platform-switched implant that has a conical connection. And when chewing laterally on this implant, there's re really little micro movement at all. Um, on the right hand side we have an old school implant um, that certainly has a lot of space underneath it and um, has sort of an external bevel um, and that one had quite a bit of space. 
So why is screw loosening bad? So um, this is not my patient on the image below, but I tell you, um, that kind of presentation, that very pussy and very angry looking gingiva around a loosened abutment screw is very common and very scary. Um, I've placed implants and done immediate temporization only to have uh, my temporary loosen up and I'll see something like that and immediately think, oh my God, I lost the implant. And when we look at screw loosening in general, um, as long as we torque our abutment screws down to the proper uh, amount of torque um, with the implant system I use, that's 30 newton centimeters of torque. I like to use a multi-torque wrench that you see above. Um, the average amount of screw loosening in modern implants is about 6%. That's not a really big amount. However, in external hex implants that we used before, it can be up to 57% of screw loosening. But hey, what happens when you have a screw loose? And, um, and uh, this is a bigger discussion and certainly uh, a topic for another webinar or a class. Um, I've really moved from doing a lot of cemented restorations to screw retained restorations. And so if you have an abutment that happens to loosen up, the first uh, little game you're going to play is find the abutment screw. Um, if you're really, really good and always put your implant in the center of the edentula space, it should be easy to find. Um, if it's not, uh, you can always look at your x-ray and see where that is. But in essence, what you do is you cut a hole through the crown into the abutment and make yourself a quote-unquote screw mentable restoration. So go ahead and pop that out, play some Teflon tape. Um, I use a combination of two types of composites. Um, I really like Flowit ALC from Premier um, as my flowable composite. And you can see how opaque that is. And then I use a paste composite over the top. This is 0.4 by Kerr, um, which I have the opaque version. Um, the name of the game in filling um, accesses uh, on screw retained crowns, or if you're doing a screw mentable restoration, is you know making sure that you pack enough Teflon tape to opaque that out. We talk about screw loosening a lot, but my bane of existence <laughs> as a restorative dentist um, is screw breakage. And lucky, uh, I'm lucky in that I haven't seen a lot of broken screws in my day. Um, but when you do have a broken screw, it's certainly something you want to avoid. And again, the topic today is the abutment connections. So we'll talk about avoiding this in the first place. But just real quick, let's talk about what happened. So this patient came in. Um, I had done a titanium base with a ceramic uh, screw retained restoration on top. Um, I use this type of tool. There's different names for it. Um, Implant Direct calls it the SXT. And no, that's not something that teenagers do with their phones. The SXT stands for Screw Extraction Tool. Um, it's spun clockwise, and as it goes in clockwise, it backs out. Um, the screw. And as a side note, um, I like to always use the abutment screws that come with my implants, the native abutment screw. Um, in Implant Direct, we get a free screw that comes with it. However, if you're using a different company, you may want to buy the abutment screw that is native to the implant that you're using rather than um, abutment screws that may be provided by your lab or the company that makes the titanium base, I find um, them to be a little bit soft. And I think that's why this broke. One of the great things about lecturing is I get to uh, meet dentists and chit chat and talk shop with them. One uh, dentist uh, told me a really, really good trick and I've yet to try it. But if you have an electric handpiece um, and you can run your electric handpiece in reverse, he suggested if you have a broken screw to um, use a sharp new um, inverted cone burr running counterclockwise on your, your high-speed handpiece, you'll engage the screw and spin it out. Um, also, uh, piezotomes are a great way to go. Ultrasonics are another great way to go to remove broken screws. 
and I managed to get it out, and here's the final. Okay, so let's get back to the topic at hand. So um, really, if you look at um, popular connections, the three most popular connections out there um, are the trilobe. Um, the trilobe are based on the Nobel Replace implants, and there's certainly a lot of companies that have trilobe implants. Trilobe implants are how I got started in implantology. So the surgeon who was placing implants and I was restoring them used a trilobe type implant, and I thought, hey, when I started placing implants, I kind of like it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I moved on later on to an internal hex um, type implant um, and later to the conical connection. Um, one thing that's great about um, trilobe type implants is they're very, very easy to restore because the abutment only goes in three ways. Um, hex type implants do have variations in how you can restore it, um, especially if you have multiple implants and multiple abutments. That can become a little problematic, um, so um, more is not necessarily better. Um, to take it one step further, a lot of conical connection type implants um, do have hexes within them. So there is an anti-rotational feature. It's just deeper into uh, the implant itself. But uh, for the sake of this discussion and sort of my personal experience, I'll be discussing the implants I have used. Um, the legacy implant from Implant Direct is one that I have. One variation on some internal hexes is that it has what's called a 45 degree lead-in bevel. And what that means is it's kind of a conical connection um, in that it's sunk into the implant um, and there is some degree of angulation in that area that is inside the implant. Now a conical connection implant um, has a very large amount of feral or internal surface um, and that angulation is quite a bit steeper than 45 degrees. If you look at sort of implant companies um, and implant research, one thing that's nice is that implant companies kind of, I don't want to say copy off of each other, but there's certain uh, dominant trends um, that we see in implantology. Um, flat or external hex type implants um, don't have a lot of internal feral or internal contact between the sort of male portion of the abutment and the internal connection. The 45 degree lead in bevel internal hex implants, as you can see in um, the size of the abutment, the gold portion on that zirconia, is we got a little bit more. Um, however, when we go to a conical connection type implant, there is just quite a bit of internal feral or internal surface area between the abutment and the implant. Um, there is some disagreement on how you measure um, the uh, degree of internal connection that we have. Um, some people measure it from the outside, so you might hear a conical connection having a 10 degree or a 15 degree. Um, some measure it from the inside. So for the sake of this discussion, I'll be measuring it from the inside. So a butt joint type implant um, really has no degree of internal feral. Um, there's sort of a portion that guides the screw, but we don't really have much of an angulation uh, between the flat surface um, and the inside. Um, so some may even say that's a 90 degree butt joint. But for the sake of this discussion, let's just say that it doesn't. Uh, the internal hex implant has a 45 degree lead in bevel. Um, the conical connection type implant that we'll, we'll be discussing today, the interactive from Implant Direct, has uh, almost an 80 degree internal bevel. And there's internal octagon type implants that are compatible with the Straumann. Um, that is more of a Morse taper or a much steeper internal connection, which is 82 degrees. So why do we care? Why do we care what type of internal connection that we're placing? Well, again, as mentioned earlier, surgically or restoratively, um, the name of the game is to place an implant that's going to stay there forever. 
um, we want to minimize the amount of bone loss that we have around our implants. And as stated before, and we know this in perio, that if a patient comes in with tartar all over their teeth and poor oral hygiene, um, we'll see inflammation of the gingiva or gingivitis. Um, that sustained inflammation uh, will lead to periodontitis. So if we have an implant, obviously we don't have a periodontium and we can't use the same terminology, but if we have localized inflammation around the top of our implant or implant platform, that sustained inflammation will lead to bone loss over time. So let's talk about how uh, abutments connect with the rest of the implant. So the external hex or implant or the internal trilobe um, are described as flat on flat connections. And if you look at the image to the right, you can see that external hex is really a butt joint with the connection inside the implant. And if you look to the image to the left, you can see too that there's really no degree of taper between that sort of male portion of the abutment and the internal connection. As a result, you really got to sort of open up the inside of the implant to allow these to clear. Imagine having a crown prep, and your crown prep has zero degree of taper. Um, any casting problem or problem with the lab will prevent that crown from seating. So as a result, you're going to need more die spacer. And, and in implants with a flat-on-flat -flat connection, they typically have a large amount of space inside the implant, and that turns into a micro pump. Um, as the tooth uh, people chew laterally, uh, more and more saliva and bacteria will be pumped into the inside of the implant. And this is just sort of shows you the difference between the two. Now one thing that's very interesting, and we'll talk a little bit about tactile feel, uh, when using a, a conical connection, because there's such a large amount of the abutment that fits inside, as you torque the abutment down, there is a sort of spreading effect between that conical con or the conical connection and the internal part of the abutment. And the abutment will actually spread the implant laterally that gives us um, quite a bit of cold welding and further um, prevents any sort of micro movements on the implant. One side note, which is an interesting uh, thing and this certainly has happened to me, which is no fun at all, <laughs> but when you're using um, an, uh, a uh, trilobe type implant, sometimes those points of the hex uh, the titanium can get very thin around those areas. And um, Implant Direct has certainly has taken um, measures to bolster or thicken uh, the amount of implant material around these trilobes. But I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who's ha who have had to deal with implant flowering. Um, and again, that's certainly not a fun thing to do. Uh, interesting enough, uh, reading the zipper study, um, I remember some of the first trilobe type implants. Um, I would take off the abutment screw, or maybe if I put on uh, a temporary abutment and it was ready to restore, you would take them off and, you know, dang, it would be really, really smelly in there. And so back to Dr. Zipper's analogy of the uh, galoshes and being in water, you're just getting all sorts of yucky, basically pumped into your uh, implant internal connection. And this is just an example of, of taking off an abutment and seeing the, the results of that micro pump. One other interesting um, aspect Dr. Zipperich looked at was the amount of micro gap between a platform shifted implant and a non-platform shifted implant. And this makes a lot of sense. A uh, platform shifted implant will display much less of a micro gap than something that does not. And I think that really just plays hand in hand with the diameter of the implant. The amount of movement you get obviously 
as you get to the edges or fringes of a very large abutment, that is going to move. Just another image showing the difference between flat on flat and conical. Um, the take home message really is uh, that by minimizing the amount of space inside the internal connection um, and also having this bolstering effect of the implant pushing laterally onto the internal connection and sealing things up and getting cold welding, we can minimize that micro gap. As stated before, um, this area marked in orange is the area where the implant will spread laterally. Um, one thing that's nice if we have um, a lot of good bone is that bone is also going to be pushing back. So as that spreads laterally, the bone will push back and further um, squeeze that and decrease the amount of micro movement. So as an aside, people often ask me, hey, Implant Direct is an awesome company. They have 16, 18 different types of implants. Um, that's so cool. And then other people say, hey, wait a minute. There is 16 or 18 different imp uh, implants out there. Why should I choose one or the other? Well, um, I have evolved. Um, from utilizing a trilobe implant to utilizing an internal hex implant to now using a conical connection type implant. And so there's certain aspects of the implant that I personally use, the interactive, that I really like. Um, I like the taper of the implant. It has very aggressive threads. I like uh, the concept of micro threads as we approach um, the crestal bone. Um, these micro threads get smaller and smaller, exerting less force on cortical bone. We know that medullary bone um, has a much greater blood supply and is less prone to bone loss versus cortical bone, which has less vascularity. So I don't want to over torque that area. One other cool thing um, about the interactive is the way that this little snappy portion attaches to the abutment. That portion is captured within the implant or within the impression um, as we take an impression and we are able then to place our analogs with a metal on metal connection. As stated uh, before, um, the um, having that uh, conical connection coupled with a very nice platform switch um, really kind of decreases the amount of micro movement and bone loss that we have. Uh, the micro threads as we approach the uh, cortical portion of the bone as described for are also uh, beneficial to decreasing bone loss. Um, often uh, I'm asked, too, what are some other factors in, that factor into my choice of um, using an implant or not using an implant? And you really have to ask yourself um, how you restore. Um, are you a custom abutment, screw retain uh, type of girl or guy? Um, or do you like just using a stock abutment and, you know, gluing stuff on and just being done with it? Um, some people feel very comfortable placing their implant and placing the abutment um, and managing the tissue. Um, some people will rather just have their specialist go ahead and put an abutment on and give you some sort of a snappy cap or some sort of easy way of taking an impression. Um, one concept that's near and dear to my heart is guided implant surgery. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit the difference between fully guided and freehand placement of implants after utilizing a surgical guide, and there's certainly implants that cater more to that. One thing I do like about the implants that I currently place are all in one packaging. Um, I remember back in the day when I started placing implants, um, I didn't know what to order, and as a result, I forgot <laughs> to order healing abutments, uh, abutment screws, um, impression, copings. Um, so I do like the fact that we have um, various types of uh, packaging um, that allow me to have all those things in one 
And really the only thing I have to purchase is lab analogs if I do uh, want to send out to a lab. Just a quick um, talk about fixture mounts. Um, I use implants um, that if I'm not doing guided implant surgery have mounts on them. And fixture mounts that um, are available at Implant Direct have different sort of ways. Uh, we have fixture mounts like the purple one you see in the far left, um, whose only job is really to take the implant into the mouth um, and serve as a closed tray impression coping. Um, we have fixture mounts which can be utilized to retrofit a denture into a temporary hybrid, like this. Uh, this is a replant mount that you see next to the purple one, um, or a Legacy 2 mount is very similar. Um, these screw retained mounts could also be utilized as temporaries. Um, the gold uh, above and that you see um, is utilized with a uh, legacy type implant. I think this one actually is a um, some sort of a replant uh, one, which serves as both a preparable uh, abutment as well as a closed tray mount. Um, and then finally, on your right, we do see uh, what you would expect from a conical connection type implant or the legacy four type implant, which has a nice platform shape. You can use mounted or unmounted implants on the images to the left. You can see what a fixture mount looks like. Uh, image on your right is a mount-free design. Um, just a matter of personal preference. Um, if I had my way, um, every implant I would place would have a fixture mount. And the reason why is we engage the mount with our hex tools, place it into the osteotomy, and if the hex tool is not seated all the way, or maybe we're a little heavy-handed. Um, and if we damage the mount, the mount can be removed and the implant can be engaged internally and placed the rest of the way. Um, on the image on the right-hand side, uh, with that implant, if I happen to not seat my hex tool or over-torque it, um, we'll have an issue uh, with possibly bending the internal connection and causing flowering. We talked about the conical connections. What are some of the advantages of uh, an internal hex implant? In this case here, this is a legacy implant. Well, we sort of have a conical connection already. So we have a 45 degree lead in bevel that does provide a degree of stability laterally when the patient chews. Um, I talked a little bit before about the bolstering effect or the wedging effect in a conical connection of the abutment um, going into the internal connection and the resistance you may have from the bone or the lateral walls of the implant. Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, when I'm placing a, an abutment, um, really I'm doing it blind. I mean, I can't see that platform. It's covered in gingiva unless I'm laying a flat and looking at it directly. Um, if I've used a healing abutment, I'm really trying to look through the gingiva. When I have a internal connection type implant like the Legacy, and I grab a hold of the abutment and it seats, I can really feel that. Um, it's a really nice feeling to know that my abutment is down all the way. If I'm using a trilobe, you really feel it. It really feels nice and locked down. And if by some chance you've trapped gingiva between the abutment or trapped gingiva into the internal connection, you got this kind of squishy feeling. I don't know what the proper term is, but it doesn't feel like metal on metal. It doesn't feel like I'm down all the way. One drawback of a conical connection is there's resistance when you see the abutment because of that sort of wedging effect. And sometimes I don't trust it. And so sometimes I feel like maybe my abutment's not down all the way. And so I have to take a lot more radiographs of conical connection type implants to verify seeing than I do with internal hex type implants. Within the Implant Direct product line, we uh, do have different um, types of, of the Legacy line of implants, the Legacy 2 line and the Legacy 4 are what I want to talk about. If you are a screw-retained um, 
custom abutment type of dentist, um, I would guide you towards the Legacy 2. Legacy 2 comes with a mount that can become a cylinder for a screw retained temporary or a retrofitted denture. Um, it is less expensive than its counterpart, which is the Legacy 4. The Legacy 4 has the exact same implant body. Um, the implant bodies are the same between the two. However, um, it has a very nice stock abutment. So if you say, look, I'm just going to be doing uh, maybe zirconia or PFM or gold crowns, just want to glue it on and be done with it, the Legacy 4 has got a very nice platform shift, preparable abutment, um, and you're good to go. So if you know you're going to be custom and you're not going to be using the abutment, you can save a few bucks going with the Legacy 2 versus the Legacy 4. However, if you feel comfortable with just cementing all your, your restorations, um, go for the Legacy 4. It's a, a really nice implant. As a side note that I like about the internal hex type implant that I use, the Legacy line, um, is that there's so many really nice um, sizes. And I got to tell you, I, I miss that. <laughs> and so I'm trying to be exclusive um, to um, the interactive implant, uh, but there's really only four uh, implants within the line of that. So there's a 3.0, um, a 3.7, I think a 4.3, and a 5.0 in the interactive line. In the legacy line, we've got a gazillion different ones. We have the 3.2, the 3.7, uh, the 4.2, the 4.7, 5.2, uh, 5.7, and 7. Um, I got to tell you, my two favorite ones in the line are the 4.7, which I really like to use in immediate premolars, um, and the 3.0, uh, 3.2, I'm sorry, which I use in uh, all lower anterior teeth and laterals. Um, one of the big things that uh, made me change from the legacy to the interactive really didn't have anything to do with the connection. I know I had enough people telling me, look, you got to go with conical connection. Um, it's better. Um, but really what got me to switch is the amount of work I do with chair-side CAD CAM um, and the fact that most chair-side CAD CAM, whether it's E4D, CIRAC, um, 3Shape, are based on the standard Zimmer internal hex sizes, which is a 3.5 platform, a 4.5 platform, and a 5.7 platform. That really cool 3.2 millimeter implant that I loved, and Legacy 2 does not have a compatible tie base um, outside of Implant Direct. So Implant Direct does make a tie base for it, uh, which can be used with press ceramics. However, with milled ceramics, um, a lot of the times you're going to have to use um, a larger implant or um, use a stock zirconia button. So uh, if I'm using the light blue 3.2, I love to use stock um, abutments with them. Um, the taper on lower laterals and lower centrals as well as upper laterals, there's not a lot of flare in the cervical of the teeth that we're replacing. Um, so that's something that um, if you're okay, with using a stock zirconia abutment in those cases, which I've been, I think you're good. Um, one thing to note, the interactive does have a compatible tie base um, with most chair-side CAD CAM systems that correspond to the 3.0 platform. One thing left to, to note, that if you're using a mount-free design of implants, you can buy uh, these little restorative packs, and these restorative packs are kind of cool. Um, these were originally designed uh, for specialists that were placing abutments for their GPs. So if you don't feel comfortable taking a bone level impression and would like to have the ease of a snappy cap and having someone just put that abutment on for you, um, this is a nice thing to work out with your specialists in these restorative packs. Another side note, um, I love guided implant surgery. And again, come to Vegas, um, or you can see me lecture nationwide. Um, or if you're on Facebook, uh, if you go to Digital Enamel or Implants Made Easy, you can see some of my stuff. But I love placing implants guided. And as more and more research comes out, um, the ability to place your implant through a surgical guide 
um, really increases the accuracy and the ease of the procedure. Um, one thing that you can't use uh, when you're doing guided surgery and placing implants through the guide is uh, most fixture mounts. They're either too wide or they don't engage uh, the guide tubes in our surgical guides. Um, so one of the other reasons why I switched to the interactive implant was because there were guide sleeves that I could purchase. In this case, um, the Nobel Replace uh, conical connection um, guided mounts work perfectly with the interactive, and I can place those through my guide. Um, a quick note, we're running out of time here, so um, I want to finish this up, is to talk about platform shifting, and that really has a lot to do with our internal connection and the newer types of implants we use. Now, I don't know if this story is true, um, but I heard that platform uh, switching or platform shifting was invented by accident. A periodontist was placing implants that came in a small, medium, and large size implant, and on those implants, small, medium, and large type abutments were available. Um, the doctor placed a large implant, but when he went to put the abutment on for his restoring dentist, he said, oh man, I don't have a large abutment, you know what, I'll just stick a medium above and I'm sure he'll be good. And one thing he noticed was that the uh, abutment actually had bone growing over the implant connection, uh, which is what we would love. Uh, you know, we deal with the fact that we get some bone recession around some implants, usually to the level of the first thread. But gosh, if we could get bone growing over the top, of our implant, that would be really great. And that's where platform sh uh, switching comes in. Hand in hand with platform uh, shifting is that if you look at the zippered studies and we talk about micro gaps and micro movements, um, the further we could put the implant abutment connection away from the bone, the less contact that bone will be with pathogens that are getting sucked into the implant. And the ultimate version of moving the internal connection away from the sides of the implant is the tissue level implant. The tissue level implant takes that abutment uh, implant interface and moves it even above the tissue. And so tissue level implants have a transmucosal portion that takes that away from it. Um, and you can see in this diagram where that connection is. So on the image on your left, you see an internal connection and that abutment implant interface is millimeters away from the side, where on the right you can see an external bevel where the abutment implant interface is right on the bone. And we all have patients like this. Uh, they are walking implant museums. So this patient has all sorts of different implants in his mouth. Um, my pet peeve with tissue level implants are that they're really tough to restore in my opinion. Um, I like to develop my emergence profile, um, preferably from the level of the bone up. Um, and when it comes to a tissue level implant, we are dictated. Um, by this emergence profile. You can see the progression in platform shifting as we move through the ages of implantology with our triload implants having no platform shifting, um, our internal hex implant having a little bit more, and our conical connection having the most amount of platform shifting. You can see in this cutaway version of the difference between those two, the image on the left you can see where that abutment implant interface will interact with bone. And with our conical connection implant, we really have the best of both worlds. We are really far away from that, and we also have uh, much less of a micro gap due to lateral movement. As a side note, this has nothing to do with internal connections. Um, I just wanted to show the differences between um, the types of implants and the way that thread patterns are. Um, as we approach the, if you look at the base of each implant, our threads are fairly aggressive, and as we approach the platform, those threads become smaller and smaller. Now, if you look at the interactive implant feature, you might see some threads um, towards the coronal portion. 
some people believe that if we do have bone loss and we have, have micro threads, that somehow the tissue will attach to those micro threads and form a cuff or a more stable uh, position of the tissue around that implant. So whether or not that's true, um, time will tell. Just a quick note about internal connections and indexing, and this goes back to why people really love trilobes versus conical connections, is that it's so easy to index a trilobe type implant. There's only three ways that implant is going to go. Um, and some people say that indexing only really matters if you're using stock or angled abutments. If you're using a custom abutment, you really don't have to worry about how things are turned. One of the last few points I want to sort of emphasize the difference between trilobes and other conical connections. Um, one thing that's interesting is that if you look at a wood screw, a wood screw has just one helix going about the wood screw. And if you look at screw physics, um, if you turn a wood screw 360 degrees, the wood screw will travel apically uh, the distance between the threads of the screw. So if my threads are a millimeter apart and I am worried about being close to a nerve, and I turn my implant 360 degrees, I know that will turn, or that will travel one millimeter. Implant direct implants travel about 1.2 millimeters per 360 degree turns. Now you can see uh, the two, uh, with the arrows, how much further the trilobe will travel more than the hex, uh, based on if we wanted to move those trilobes into position. One other thing to, to note between um, hexes versus trilobes is if you're using the all-on-four type method. If you're using the all-on-four, we know that we have our anterior implants as anterior as we can get, and our distal implants, we're going to tip those implants distally. Now, if we tip our implants distally and we have to restore it, we got a little bit of a problem. And so now we're going to have to upright those implants, um, and to do so, we use angled screw receiving abutments. The distal implants have engaging connectors, uh, the anterior implants do not. So those engaging connectors, we are limited by indexing, and if we don't turn our implants correct, um, and we try to correct for that, um, we have a problem. My argument is that a hex is better, whether that hex is an uh, external, or a 45 degree lead and bevel or a conical, because a hex just gives you a little bit more wiggle room if you don't index it perfectly. On a side note about economics, if you're looking at implant direct implants and cost, um, the cost between uh, an internal hex implant and a conical connection are really not that different. It's about 10 bucks. Um, so if you're asking me, <laughs> I'd rather spend 10 bucks to have less micro movement. If you want to go with a mount free design, um, there's also a $10, actually it's, it's like a $5 difference between those two. All right, so um, I'm done uh, with my presentation. We're gonna open up to questions here in a little bit. Um, but if you ever wanna get a hold of me, the easiest way is to find me on Facebook or find me on digitalenamel.com where I post most of my, uh, my stuff. Um, or if you want to send me an email, augustdds at gmail.com, um, but I respond much quicker to instant messaging. So let me go ahead and pull up the panel, and let's take a look at some of these questions. Does the larger conical connection weaken the collar? Good question. Uh, that's something that um, has kind of worried me, to be honest with you. Um, I know that um, all these different implant companies have done studies um, about that. But um, that would be a concern that I would have. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and that's something that really kind of um, sits in my head between um, the trilobe implant and uh, moving to something that's thicker. Um, another question here is, what are your options for an implant if you have flowering of a trilobe implant? Well, <laughs> you're kind of... Uh, SOL, as we like to say. Um, I had one that flowered, 
and I was able, I was placing it and I flowered it, and I was able to grab a hold um, of um, the sides with a hemostat and unscrew it. Um, but what if, let's say, you have a trilobe implant and in function it flowers? Um, there is the implant removal tool that Implant Direct sells where you can actually screw into the implant itself and back it out. Um, if you, just for fun, if you go on Digital Enamel and you look up um, an article that I did, I did an article about how I used, and I know this sounds crazy, guys, um, an electrosurge. Um, and I know this sounds kind of wacky, but just follow me. Um, there are some researchers, I don't have the research paper, uh, but there are some guys in Italy um, that had a really interesting study. So we don't use electrosurge uh, normally around implants, right? And why is that? Uh, because if we touch the implant, the implant's going to heat up and bone is going to necrose around it. Um, so what these researchers did is they looked at numbing up a patient if you have a broken implant and you want to get it out, touching the implant for about 20 seconds with an electrosurge, um, coming back a week later and it came right out. Um, the alternate uh, would be to use a trephin um, and hog out um, around the implant itself, which can be quite destructive. Um, they did mention that you don't, they had a, a voltage amount um, an amount of time, you don't want to touch the implant too too much, but obviously broken implants are something that uh, um, uh, we have to deal with. I have a dentist down the hall, her dad broke off an implant on number 19 and broke it off all the way past the internal connection. So there's nothing to grab a hold of it. So we're going to try this technique. I've used it once and it worked great. Um, others have said that there is a greater amount of bone necrosis around it, so you do want to use it at your own risk. Okay. Um, would putting some Neosporin on the screw help? I've heard people use that, um, and that certainly sounds like a great idea um, to do that. So uh, what some people do is put Neosporin on the abutment screws before they torque it down as a little bit of... Uh, effect. Um, you know what, if, uh, you know, the best way to avoid a problem is to just not have it, so um, utilizing a conical connection would preclude that, but if you're a uh, trilobe user and want to continue to use trilobe, I think that would be a great way um, to do it. What driver do you use for interactive? Um, they have their own drivers, so there are um, uh, tools to, um, to get that carried, uh, carried into it. Um, so when you have your kit, um, the regular Spectra system or standard kit, you will have to buy different tools. Now, the screw, you still use the 1.25 millimeter hex. Uh, can you use Cirrus Guide 2 with interactive, noble active implant guide driver? So um, the question is for a system called Cirrus Guide 2, if you're a Cirrus and Galeos user, um, this is a milled chair side surgical guide system um, that, um, that we use. Uh, you definitely can use um, Cirrus Guide 2 with interactive. You want to purchase the um, Nobel Replace, not Nobel Active, but the Nobel Replace Conical Connection Guided Mount. That's quite a, a mouthful. Um, and so the Nobel Replace Conical Mount fits the interactive and fits the first two tubes in Cirrus Guide 2. So Cirrus Guide 2 has a small, medium, and large guide tube. Just by the Nobel Replace Conical, the smallest one is called the NP or uh, narrow platform, and the RP is the 4.3. Don't get the WP or Y platform, it doesn't fit Cirrus Guide 2. Um, here's another question. Um, is the interactive implant placed at the bone level or below the crest? Ooh, uh, this is a good one to talk about. So I have always been a fan of placing my implants between a half a millimeter and a millimeter. And Carl Misch had said um, that we can expect between zero and two millimeters of bone loss on any implant we place. So why don't we just get going on that? place our implants a little subcrestal, and if we happen to lose bone, we're still below the crest. 
Now with platform shifted implants, the name of the game is to actually get bone growing over the top of your implant. So, um, you know, if you're supracrestal, you're never going to get bone growing over the top of it, right? So, um, so I place my implants a millimeter, and I'm actually going a little more, like a millimeter and a half. And I heard someone lecture who had a really good point. They said that cortical bone has very little blood supply, but medullary bone has a lot. So why would you want to put your implant platform in um, sort of cortical bone that could resorb? Why don't you stick it in the medullary bone and um, let that bone grow over the top and then come back in with a bone profiler and take it out. So I've seen guys putting implants in two to three millimeters subcrestal, which I think that's a little much, but I'm definitely in the one millimeter to 1.5, especially with platform shifted implants like the Impl uh, Interactive. Do you ever start with a full diameter healing abutment when using a platform switch final abutment? Good question. Um, you know, uh, one uh, thing that a lot of people have noticed is that sometimes some of implant direct implants uh, healing abutments are a little wider than the implant that you're placing, um, which can get caught up on bone if you're subcrestal. Um, what I did, uh, and this is not advocated by implant direct, this is just me. What I found with a lot of the implant direct implants is the abutment screws were you know, let's all the same size with the exception of the three millimeter. So what I did was I just bought a bunch of 5.7 millimeter healing abutments and I just cranked them down on all my implants, 3.7 and above, to start forming the tissue. Um, I gotta be honest with you, we all go through um, evolutions in our practice, uh, seeing our work come back and whatnot. Um, I'm going back to, and I know this sounds horrible and don't think that I'm a horrible person, but I'm going back to two stage. Um, I um, I'm doing a lot more just putting a healing cap on, getting primary closure, coming back in a month before I'm going to restore and putting an anatomic healing above it. So I use um, something called a contour healer. If you go to contourhealer.com, you'll see these. These are beautiful. And so what I'll just do is open up the tissue, do an apically positioned flap, or maybe do a little ancillary soft tissue grafting, um, and um, a month later, I'm getting these beautiful tissue profiles. But yeah, I mean, back in the day, I certainly did start with a big full diameter healing above it. Do you make custom abundance with CIREC or use a lab? I personally use CIREC um, to do that. Uh, custom abutments, I, I love doing it chair side. Um, sometimes, I gotta be honest with you, they do take a long time. And sometimes if I'm just lazy, <laughs> for lack of a better word, I'll have a lab make custom abutments. I gotta tell you, Custom Direct um, makes a titanium custom abutment for, I think it's 160, 170. Uh, that's hard to beat. Um, they don't have zirconia abutments yet. Um, so it's really, uh, it's up to you if you have a chair side CAD CAM machine um, that does it, I, I think that that's a great way to go. Um, however, I, um, I, I do make it myself. Any tricks on getting the driver tool loose from the future mount, from the fixture mount? Seems to lock in if I happen to tighten, say, past 15 Newton centimeters. I'm using Legacy 2 and 3. I'm always afraid I'm going to damage the osteotomy with the wiggling. Oh, man, this happens to all of us. Uh, so, yeah, cold welding um, can really kind of freak you out. Um, what you can do is wait. Um, uh, the heat in the mouth will sometimes loosen up that connection. Uh, what I do is, I know it's freaky uh, with the wiggling, is I just uh, get a, um, uh, a pair of uh, forceps or whatever, um, and I'll just grab a hold of it, maybe some tissue uh, scissors, and I'll just grab a hold of the abutment and I wiggle it laterally. So mesial distally, not buckle lingually. And usually I can get it out, but one time I remember, man, I really cold welded that thing and I could not get it off. And you know what I did? Immediate temporization. <laughs> so I went ahead and made it temporary on it. Uh, but usually just grab a hemostat, that's the word I was looking for, not tissue forceps. Uh, grab a hemostat um, and if you wiggle it and just give it some time, maybe go tell the patient to go 
you know, out and eat lunch or do whatever, and the heat from the mouth should take care of it. Um, what do you use the most, screw retained or cementable? Um, if I had my way, I would only do screw retained. Um, I just, I've had problems with cement sepsis. Uh, I've taken post-op bite wings and I thought I got all the cement out. And then when the implant failed, I could see it. So if I had my way, I would do screw retain. That being said, you can do screw retain in everything. So about 80% screw retain in the posterior, about 50% in the anterior. Uh, question here, have you had any issues developing emergence profile in the molar areas using the interactive? Um, I haven't. But that being said, I do have a tendency to place my implants deeper than most. So remember, emergence profile is all about developing that runway, that three to four millimeters between the implant platform and um, the CEJ of your future crown. So I personally have not had a problem with the interactive. I don't really see how, and maybe I'm missing the point here, how that would be any different from any other implant, maybe with um, the amount of uh, conical connection, but I personally have not found that. Uh, let's see here. In general, do you prefer the internal hex or the conical? Oh, you had to ask me that. Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I know the conical is good for me. <laughs> it's good for my patients. It's it's the way that everyone is going. Um, I The majority of my implants have an internal hex. I do like that tactile sensation um, of an internal hex when I'm placing that abutment. Um, and it's kind of weirding me out with placing the abutment um, in the conical connection and feeling that sort of pushback. Um, but I would have to say that going forward, I am ordering all conicals and I'm just going through my stock of legacies. So I personally prefer the conical connection. Can you cold weld the interactive abutment to the implant by over torquing? And uh, what's rec recommended? torque value. Um, well, the uh, screw recommended torque value is 30. Um, when I'm placing an implant in the bone, I like to stay between 30 and 50 Newton centimeters. And absolutely, you can cold weld the interactive, just like any other implant. If you um, torque it too much, um, it's going to um, it's going to be a, a, an issue for you. And again, um, I think that um, cold welding would be a little scarier with a conical connection versus an internal hex because there is greater surface area and a greater tendency to do it. Um, I showed before uh, an image of the multi-torque wrench from Implant Direct. I highly recommend that you only use a ratchet to index your implant, but in general, try to use a multi-torque wrench and not to exceed 60 Newton centimeters of torque when you're putting an implant in. If your implant is not going down and it keeps disengaging at 60, um, take a step back and ask yourself, what can I do to my osteotomy to make this implant go down? So do I need to open up it bigger, uh, go to a bigger drill size, use a Crestle bone drill, or use a tap for maybe a different company to get that in there? If you're using a Cirex scan body to fabricate an implant crown, will there be a difference in the height of the scanned body versus the tie base due to the final seating of the tapered fit? Um, great question. Um, yeah, you got to make sure that your um, tie base, your scan post, uh, your scan body um, is down all the way. And so go ahead and take a follow-up x-ray. Um, there shouldn't be a difference in the occluso cervical height of a scan body versus the tie base into it because that would be a big problem. So um, yeah, just make sure that you're down all the way. Make sure you take um, make sure you take uh, uh, an x-ray to make sure you're seated. What happens when you go back to put in the healing cap and the bone is too high to screw it completely in? Well now, a healing cap, let, let's talk about the difference between a healing cap and a healing abutment. So it's a healing cap it's going to be a little smaller in diameter than a platform shifted implant. So if your implant is five millimeters subcrestal, you should be able to get the healing cap on. 
Now, a healing abutment is another story. A healing abutment may be wider than the implant you're using. If that's the case, take the healing cap, put it down onto the implant and screw it in. Different companies do have um, types of burrs called bone profilers. Um, you could try to be very gentle and use the crestful bone drill. What I have done, and this is just me, August, your buddy talking, it's not advocated by implant director or anyone else. I'll put the healing cap on. I like to use a carbide um, chamfer. Um, I know Patterson sells it or Pearson. It's by, um, God, I forgot the name of it. But if you look at any of my posts that are up on Digital Enamel, um, they have it. It's Meisinger. I'm sorry, Meisinger makes it. And then make sure you put that healing cap on. And then I'll just run that with a lot of water and just start beveling um, that excess bone so I can get the healing cap down. Uh, what do you think about osteodensification like VersaBur? Oh my God, I did a case, my first case the other day with it. I think osteodensification is awesome and it's the way to go. Um, those of you that don't know what the VersaBurs are, uh, the VersaBurs are run in reverse after you start with a pilot and they compress the bone like a rotary osteotome instead of cutting it away and it's freaky. You can see these post-op x-rays where the implant has like a zone of um, radio opacity around it. It's really awesome. Um, I think it's awesome. I think it's it's definitely the way to go. Um, I would worry about osteodensification in D1 bone because we're already dealing with very dense bone, but obviously you wouldn't use it in D1 bone. But gosh, in D3 or D4 bone, I would be all over that. A, non uh, a non-tapped implant in D1 bone engages bone only at the edge of each thread. A ratchet in reverse will break hold well in a fixture mount. Hey, there you go. Um, yeah, um, definitely uh, uh, unscrewing uh, the screw using a ratchet in reverse would, would do that. Uh, my only thought would be how much you cold welded it, and if you exceeded 100 or 150 newton centimeters of torque, would you bend the fixture mount itself? But um, definitely cold welding is a problem, and uh, certainly freaks me out from time to time. Um, to restore posterior implants 19, 20, or 14, or 15, do you splint them? Great question. Um, I only splint implants if I'm using short implants, uh, or someone has like really, really crappy bone, like D4 bone. So if I've got like three 10 millimeter implants, I'm not going to splint them. Um, but if I have a couple of eights and sixes, I'm definitely going to want to splint them. Um, if you splint them, you know, it's more a matter of personal preference. Um, I know patients want their old teeth back and they don't like uh, implants that are splinted, but if you're dealing with a bone density issue or a short implant issue, then I, I, I do splint. I like scanning scan bodies like yourself, CAD Geek 2. Do you have a preference of scan bodies types and manufacturer? Great question. Um, I'm limited. Um, I'm a, a CIREC user, so with my scanner, um, you know, I have to use the Serona scan bodies. Um, but you know, there's lots of different companies out there. I know Three Eyes Navigator System. I guess people really like that um, as far as the scan body goes. Uh, I know Implant Direct uh, is coming out with a line or, or has a line of scan bodies that you can use to send to Custom Direct. Um, I think it really depends on the system you're using and the manufacturer. Uh, good question here. Hey, August, so are you saying there is less screw loosening with conical connection? Yes. Um, I think that, that was the gist of the Zipford studies, that a conical connection platform shifted implant had the least amount of screw loosening. Do you like rotary expanders? I do like rotary expanders, um, especially I don't do full-on lateral lifts. Um, i got to be honest with you, I just haven't taken a class on how to do them. Um, but I love summer's lifts and internal lifts, and I use rotary expanders a lot. Um, I've seen it uh, used like the Densa to bulk out ridges that are deficient. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of rotary expanders for sure. I have an actual clinical case where the abutment and crown are loosened. I did not place the implant, neither the crown. The implant was placed over 15 years ago, as well as the crown. 
Um, I know the abutment and crown loosened. What would be the best way to help this patient giving the fact that we don't know what the implant brand and size is. Well, um, I hate to keep giving out this guy's email, but Darwin Badgley is awesome, and he can probably tell you which implant you're dealing with. Um, so, um, you know, you can send Darwin. Um, I, I know you can contact Implant Direct, and they'll get you to hold of Darwin. You can give him um, the radiograph, and he'll tell you. You can send it to me, and I can tell you what it is. Um, Sometimes you just get what you get. So sometimes you just have to get in there, get it out, and see what you have in your armamentarium. I mean, I've, I've dealt with all sorts of different weird implants, and surprisingly, the abutment screws were all the same. Um, so I was able to use another abutment screw and turn it into a screw-mentable restoration um, like the one I showed. Uh, what tie base do you use for the three? 0.0 and 3.4 interactive and Emacs box. So this is a question that's geared towards CIREC users. Um, for um, that purple implant, so the three millimeter uh, uh, platform, you're going to use the 4.5 Noble Active um, tie base. And for the gold, you're going to use the, the 5.0. Uh, what uh, do you torque your screws and then wait 10 minutes and torque one last time? So I, some, I do. I don't wait 10 minutes because I think maybe my adult onset ADD won't allow it, but I do wait two minutes. So um, I'll start uh, at about 20, um, and then I'll torque it down to 20, and I'll wait two minutes, and then I go um, uh, to 25, and I wait two minutes, and then um, do the last uh, 30 Newton centimeters. All right, thanks, guys. Have a good night. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and send me an email to augustdds at gmail.com.